of Education and Public Programs. So here we go. Cam, are you ready? Uh, I am indeed. Okay. Okay, so today we're going to talk about 20th century celebrities and dignitaries who came to Morvin. And uh, the reason they came to Morvin was because of some of these folks here. Uh, we're going to meet Helen Hamilton Shield Stockton. We're going to meet Robert Wood Johnson Jr. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the governor's era. So here's beautiful Morvin, and it really does look starting to look like this now. If you came to visit, you would see uh, the wisteria starting to bloom on the front porch and the flowering trees in bloom. So why wouldn't want people want to come to visit? And we're going to go a little bit next door to start things off. We're going to go to the Battle Monument dedication. I'm Kim Gallagher, and this is another Morvan moment on a beautiful spring day in Princeton, New Jersey. And in this Morvan moment, we're going to talk about uh, visitors, celebrities, uh, people who came to Morvan in the 20th century. And we're going to start with the person who was in charge of Morvan, or at least she thought she was in charge of Morvan, in 1900. That was Helen Hamilton Shields Stockton, who had married Bayard Stockton in 1894. Uh, and she lived in the house with, uh, with <laughs> various siblings, with her father, and she is the one who created the main celebrity we're gonna be talking about today. And that main celebrity is Morvan itself, because it was Helen Hamilton Shield Stockton, who from the 1890s to almost 1930, made sure that Morvan was included in every history book about historical houses in America, and, and also many articles in magazines. She was the one who put it on the map. So our first, <laughs> our first celebrity for today, actually, is Morvan. Okay, now let's talk about some human celebrities. Imagine uh, that we're uh, here in Princeton in this location, uh, on June 9th, 1922. This is uh, when Helen and Bayard Stockton were the owners and people who lived in Morvan. Uh, on June 9th, 1922, this monument, the battle monument right behind me, was dedicated after about 40 years of trying to get it built. Bayard himself, in fact, was the chairman who got it built. And it was his, <laughs> his son, Bayard, who ended up unveiling it as part of the ceremony. Now, there were some very distinguished people here for, uh, for that event. The speaker for the, uh, for the celebration, for the, the christening, so to speak, of the battle monument was the president himself, the 29th president of the United States, Warren G. Harding. Uh, he was only 14 months away from passing away in, in, uh, in office, but he was, he, was, he was going pretty strong on, on that day. And in fact, uh, if you want to uh, read his speech, I actually have a transcript of it, and it's, it's quite good. Uh, there were other guests here as well, uh, including Senator Walter Edge of New Jersey, who uh, was very impressed by the family and the house. And also uh, Robert Wood Johnson was here, who also was a friend of the family uh, and was very impressed by the house. And of course, those are people who ended up living here uh, in the next few decades. So once the uh, unveiling was done, the speeches were given, then all the all the guests, including the President of the United States, trooped on over to Morvan to have a luncheon together. And here they all are, trooped on over to Morvan uh, on the front porch. So Kim, did you want to share something about this? Uh, yeah, the, uh, um, first of all, uh, <laughs> when, when we were filming this, we, we thought that we were we're getting Morvan actually in the shot. So when you see me pointing at what, what seems to be actually the monument or the bush right next to the monument, I, I was trying to point to Morvan, which of course is, uh, for those of you who know, is, is only about 100 feet uh, away from the, uh, the Princeton Battle Monument. Uh, in this photo, uh, you can see uh, President Harding right in the middle, um, flanked by a couple of uh, kids. 
Um, the uh, the I mentioned that the speech he gave was uh, was pretty good. Now uh, there's actually a part. I, this is kind of self-serving, but I, I used to paraphrase part of his speech when I used to give uh, tours over at the Princeton Battlefield uh, Park. Uh, and it's you remember this is a hundred years ago, so it's a little over the top oratorical. But let me just read a, a couple of sentences from uh, the speech. So this, imagine President Harding uh, saying these words. There was a desperate chance to win a telling victory, which would convert the New Jersey campaign into a disaster for the enemy. And there was also the possibility of winning a political victory by demonstrating the capacity of American leadership and American soldiers to outwit and outfight veterans of European battlefields. Washington, who is at once soldier, politician, and statesman, recognized all these possibilities. He seized the opportunity. Okay, <laughs> maybe a bit melodramatic, uh, but uh, good words and ones I used myself in describing the events of January 3rd, 1777, which is when the uh, uh, Princeton, uh, Battle of Princeton occurred. Actually, the words that I, uh, <laughs> of Harding's that I liked the best were, were actually reported the following day in the New York Times, uh, June 10th. Uh, 1922. Uh, not only did Harding uh, 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 sort of be the, the the key person at the dedication of the ceremony, he also got an honorary degree from Princeton University, and he was overheard by a New York Times reporter talking to President John Greer Hibben, who was president of Princeton at the time, and and they were talking about the persistent legend, which has uh, well, it's been around since the Battle of Princeton, that Alexander Hamilton fired a cannon at near the end of the battle uh, at Nassau Hall to try and convince the British holding out there to surrender. And that the cannonball went through a window and uh, <laughs> went right through the portrait of, uh, right through the head of the portrait of King George II. Uh, so th this legend has been around for a long time. Uh, when, he when President Harding was discussing it uh, and the fact that it's probably apocryphal, it's more legendary than real. This President Harding replied, according to the New York Times reporter, that if it wasn't true that Alexander Hamilton trained his guns on the building during the battle, uh, it should be. And that as an adopted alumnus of the university, remember Harding had just gotten an honorary degree, he would accept the story as fact. So <laughs> it was just too good not to, to believe it. Uh, among the uh, people in here that we haven't been able to identify are those those two people who later lived in Morven. Uh, that's uh, Robert Wood Johnson Jr. and uh, Senator Walter Edge. Uh, I, if anyone, I, I kind of put put it out to some of you people uh, watching right now. If if any of you can identify some of the other people in this photo, we would be delighted to know who you think they are because we've had some difficulty doing that. Okay, over to you, Deb. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, we um, we are pretty sure that the woman with the glasses and the fancy hat with the flowers is Mrs. Harding. Um, so we're pretty sure about that. Uh, we don't see Helen Hamilton Shield Stockton for sure in this photo. We think she might be behind President Harding, but that's kind of the fun of history. That's kind of what keeps history alive is that we're always learning new things and, and still researching something that is right here, nearly a hundred years old. So um, moving on there, speaking this we know is her, this is Helen Hamilton Stockton in the Morven garden with her great Dane Viking. Um, she held a lot of garden parties uh, and we talk about some of the people who came to some of her garden parties. Uh, and we and we take a quick look at her garden, which is still in its own form at Morven now. So, and this is the photo from 1908, right? Right, that was the photo from 1908. Huh? And here we are in the Colonial Revival Garden. Uh, now, the Colonial Revival Garden was a big effort of Helen's uh, when she was living here. Uh, recall that uh, she was here from uh, about 1891 until 1928. And she was the one, as I pointed out earlier, was the one who put uh, made more of a celebrity, put it on the map. Uh, some of the other celebrity guests that she had in her time here, 
included President Grover Cleveland, uh, the only president who was elected twice, but non-consecutively. And he moved into Westland, which was one of the houses the Commodore built uh, back in the 19th century. Uh, and Westland is only a couple blocks away. So in fact, he was a neighbor uh, of the Stocktons. Uh, another celebrity, uh, important person was Woodrow Wilson, who was made president of Princeton University in 1902, and uh, was uh, in, uh, it was documented that he visited the house. Uh, we don't know that he ever visited while he was president of the United States, but he certainly did when he was president of Princeton. Now, at the end of uh, the time that uh, Helen and Bayard were here, uh, we're starting to get to around 1930. The next person to uh, live here was someone who rented the house and was one of the guests at the christening of the Battle uh, Monument in 1922. And that person was Robert Wood Johnson. In fact, if you can see in the shot, looking at the pool house and the old location of the pool, he was the person who put those in. And now we'll go take a look at those places. So, um, yeah. uh, maybe we should fill in a couple of gaps, Debbie. Um, for people who might not know who the Commodore was, uh, he lived there in mid-century. Uh, he, he was the third generation of the Stockton family who, who lived in Corbin. Right. What's that? Wanted to give his name. Oh, uh, Commodore was uh, uh, Robert Field Stockton, uh, son of Richard Stockton, the one we, we call the Duke. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he lived from 1795 to 1866 and was resident in Morvan 1840s uh, till the time of his death in 1866. So um, uh, when uh, I, I tend to, <laughs> to mention these names without explaining them. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, regarding Grover Cleveland, uh, he left office after his second term in 1897, moved to Princeton to Westland and lived in Princeton until his death in 1908. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, and, and the Commodore was one who built a lot of uh, things that are still in Morven today and including a lot of houses. So it was interesting that- Yeah, Westland, uh, the, uh, uh, I think the Lowry House it's called, the house of the where the president of the university lives. Uh, Springdale House over at um, the uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, and many more actually. But he didn't build the pool house, so let's... No, Robert Wood Johnson Jr. did that. Now the last person I mentioned was Robert Wood Johnson Jr., who moved in here in 1930. And in fact, I'm standing right next to the pool house that he had designed in 1939 and was finished about 1940 or 1941. And right behind the camera, which you have to imagine, is the apple-shaped pool that he put in as well. Uh, one other addition, and we'll be over there shortly, is a tennis court that he put over put in on the other side of the uh, of the pool house. Now, Robert Wood Johnson, when he was here in 1922, was a young vice president of Johnson and Johnson. By the time he's moved in here in 1930, uh, he is a captain of industry. I mean, he is he is in the process of making Johnson & Johnson the, the uh, enormous corporation that it is. And as such, he had plenty of distinguished and interesting visitors, uh, such as Leopold Stokowski, which he had to have as a visitor because until 1938, they were brothers-in-law. Uh, had, Leopold had married uh, his sister Evangeline. Uh, in addition, um, he, uh, he was a good friend of Georgia O'Keeffe, and, and her husband, Alfred uh, Stieglitz. And now we know that they were friends of them in New Mexico because O'Keefe spent a lot of time in New Mexico, but because Stieglitz had art galleries in New York, we're pretty sure, we're, we speculate with some certainty that they came to visit here. Now, there were also uh, actors such as David Niven. And Given the story that one of the people visiting uh, Morvan a few years ago told me, he was attended by uh, Myrna Loy. Now, we can't confirm that. Uh, it's such a good story. I hope it's true. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, high-level movie stars were among the people who were visiting the, uh, uh, the uh, Robert Wood Johnson here. Robert Wood Johnson uh, rented the house and the grounds 
Uh, yeah, Leop who is Leopold Stokowski? Yeah, uh, he was a famous, uh, very famous uh, orchestra conductor and, uh, and, and probably best known, in fact, for his connection with the uh, Philadelphia uh, Symphony Orchestra. Uh, but he, he, he covered a lot of territory. And in fact, if you remember the original movie of Fantasia that Walt Disney did, uh, there uh, part there's a, a part in there where there's an orchestra playing, uh, and really the only person you can see, and it's it in silhouette, is the conductor, and that's that's Leopold, uh, and George O'Keefe. Uh, he and uh, they were married, I think, in 1926 ish thereabouts, uh, uh, until his death in in 1946. And George O'Keefe. Uh, known as the mother of modernism uh, was a, a very important uh, uh, artist. Oh, no, 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 I'm mixing it up with Stiglitz. Sorry, Debbie, you got to correct me sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Sikowski, Sikowski was one, the one who was married to Evangeline right. uh, un, un, until they were divorced in 1938. The uh, Evangeline was the sister of Robert Wood Johnson. Right, and Stiglitz and George O'Keefe were a couple, he's 23 years her senior. She was a, a, a remarkable artist. And in fact, she had, there's a painting, a, a copy of a painting that we have at Morvin, um, Sunflower for Maggie. And right. it was created for Robert Wood Johnson's wife. And unfortunately, Robert Wood Johnson Jr. chose not to purchase it. He thought it was too expensive. And um, it, so we have a copy of it, but they were very good friends and they spent a lot of time with them uh, in New Mexico. So popular couples, uh, the handsome wild conductor were visitors at Marvin. And uh, as you can probably tell, because I've, I've done it twice now, uh, saying, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the story is so good, I hope it's true. Uh, I certainly hope Myrna Loy actually visited Marvin too. So from the time of Robert Wood Johnson Jr., we move on to the time of the governors, which as Kim said earlier, uh, Walter Edge was one of the guests at the dedication of the battle monument and he loved Morvin so much, he ended up buying it and living in it. And not only when he was governor, uh, but when he wasn't governor and then he decided this was a great place that all governors should live. So these are the governors who lived at Morvan in order, Walter and Camilla Edge, Robert and Helen Minor, Richard and Betty Hughes, William and Elizabeth Cahill, and Brandon and Jean Byrne. And as you can imagine, quite a few dignitaries and celebrities popped in and out. So here we are, this is the back of Morvan. If you were looking from the pool house toward Morvan, um, a lot of parties were held on these this grass right here. And in fact, we have a party coming up at Morvin, um, our Morvin MA Garden Party that's gonna be right there on the back lawn. So another exciting party coming up and here we'll learn about it. The first uh, governor who lived here when uh, Morvin became the official house of the governors of New Jersey was Robert J. Minor. He was elected in 1954 and served till 1962. Uh, he was a bachelor, a good looking guy. Um, we'll, we'll have another story about that shortly, but he met uh, a distant cousin of Adley Stevenson's, uh, Helen Stevenson in 1956 when he was campaigning uh, for Adley Stevenson uh, for president at Oberlin College. And uh, they fell in love and got married. And at the beginning of 1957, he and his new bride came to Morvan. So that was the first official time that a governor was in the official residence of Morvan. Now they were uh, the, uh, the miners were here at a pretty interesting time and consequently had some pretty interesting visitors, including JFK uh, during the election campaign of 1960. Uh, and Uthant, who was the uh, head of the UN, Adley Stevenson, of course, visited because uh, his cousin lived there. Uh, so the, the miners were, were uh, in the, the thick of things at the uh, beginning of the 60s uh, and the uh, Kennedy era. So Kim. 
Yeah, there, uh, we've actually uh, gotten some additional information uh, uh, about the uh, miners. Um, and this is from the Robert and Helen uh, Miner Center for Study of State and Local Government at Lafayette College over in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, Lafayette College is the alma mater of uh, Governor Miner. Uh, and uh, it, it I mean, I, I mentioned that he was, he was, he was a handsome guy. He, he was well, <laughs> well known for uh, dating a lot of people. And uh, in the, the time before he, uh, he met and, and eventually married uh, Helen Stevenson, uh, as you can see from this picture, uh, he uh, obviously knew Grace Kelly. Uh, he knew Grace Kelly's dad. They were they were friends of the family, and and they were rumored to be uh, uh, romantically connected. Uh, he was also rumored to be going out with Margaret Truman, and in uh, in addition to some of the the people we mentioned earlier who visited uh, Minor at Morven, uh, the uh, Center for Study of State and Local Government at Lafayette also mentions uh, Harry Truman, uh, Lyndon Johnson. Nelson Rockefeller, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, and uh, I don't know if we uh, mentioned it er earlier, but uh, Fidel Castro uh, visited in 1959. Uh, and, and of course, one of the famous uh, legends at Morven is the fact that it, it, there was some difficulty getting the uh, cigar ashes out of the carpet at Morven after he left. So that we says here, Grace Kelly and two governors, the other governor would be, Brendan Byrne. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, go ahead, Debbie. Yeah, no, exactly. You're right. Brendan Byrne. And uh, but first, before we talk about Brendan Byrne, we're going to mention Betty Hughes. Betty Hughes. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great shot. Uh, uh, Governor Hughes uh, followed uh, Governor Minor. Uh, Governor um, Hughes was uh, uh, the governor of New Jersey from uh, 62 to 70. Uh, and uh, th th this was the, the family, it, it was one of the, um, he, was, he was a widower, she was a widow, they both had children, they got married, uh, had some additional children. So the family had 10 kids. Uh, so you can imagine what that was like uh, at Morven. Although I think uh, by the time they were living in Morven, three of the kids were off to college. Uh, now, in, a, in addition to Governor Hughes being an important guy and, and having uh, lots of uh, uh, duties, uh, in fact, his wife, Betty, as you can see in the photo here, she was actually quite a celebrity herself as well. Uh, a very gregarious person. Um, she wrote lots of magazine articles. Uh, she was, uh, in fact, she had... Um, had a, had a column that was running for quite a while called Bulletins from Betty. And, and in fact, this got to be so, her, her uh, celebrity got to be so great that WCAU, uh, at the time a CBS television station in Philadelphia, towards the end of uh, the, their time in Mormon in 1979, actually recruited her to have a talk show, a morning talk show, which she had until uh, 1974. So uh, Betty herself was was quite uh, quite a celebrity. Right, she had a, a television show from 1969 to 1974. Yeah, they, uh, and for those of you uh, who are familiar with Philadelphia TV, that uh, WCAU was CBS then. It's now Channel 10 NBC. <laughs> so. And um, and what we say, you know, our, our Bible at Morven is a book called Morvin Memory, Myth, and Reality by Constance Grief and uh, Wanda Gunning. And I like one of the lines here, um, what Betty Hughes described as private parties, quote unquote, generally included up to 60 guests. <laughs> yeah. and, and in good weather, cocktails were served under the magnolia tree behind the solarium. Uh, and they also continued a tradition begun by the miners opening Morvin to the public one afternoon a week, but by appointment. Um, so what's interesting is our, we have magnolias still, and we have cocktail parties still in that area, and um, you know we have a great history of that. More of it. Yeah, we're about to have another one. Exactly. Anyway. So now we get to another time where Grace Kelly, the famous Grace Kelly. Um, had an influence at Morvin. Okay, and you and and for for the viewing public here, uh, you have to use a little bit of imagination. Uh, you see the 
green pole behind my left shoulder, that's actually one of the, the lights that's still uh, there uh, from when this was a uh, tennis court. Uh, so uh, just, you know, use some imagination in the next few. Historic poles, there are two historic poles. And when we give twilight tours, we spend a lot of time imagining what was happening here at the tennis court. Cause as you'll hear from Kim, a lot of interesting people came to visit um, and spent time at the tennis court. So here we go. Governor Brendan Byrne, the last governor, in fact, who lived at Morven, uh, who was governor from 1974 to 1982, was an avid tennis player. Uh, in fact, it was one of the other governors who got him to be an avid tennis player, uh, Robert Miner. Uh, from 1974 to 1982, uh, lots of activity <laughs> would have been seen here on this tennis court and at the uh, pool house and pool because the Burns were big, enter they entertained quite a bit. Uh, Brendan seemed to like it more than his wife, Jean, uh, but an awful lot of business was taken care of as well. Uh, Althea Gibson, who had won the, the uh, singles for women in, uh, at Wimbledon in 57 and 58, the first black person to uh, win at Wimbledon, uh, was the unofficial pro here. Uh, Peter Benchley, who was a neighbor, the guy who wrote Jaws, uh, used to come in uh, through the back gate over here. The real interesting uh, celebrity that we want to talk about today, though, is someone who came here to visit on August 25th, 1975. Now, she was a friend of the Burns family. She was a, a girl who grew up in uh, Philadelphia, but became a famous movie star. Her name was Grace Kelly. In uh, 1975, her son, Albert, was uh, 17 years old, and it was time to go look for uh, colleges, and Princeton was one of them. She wrote a letter to her uh, friend, Brendan Byrne, asking if uh, she could come and visit. And they had a reception here at Morven for them. It was a hot day, August 25th. Uh, one of the problems was though that they served lobster, which Grace was allergic to. And because it was a hot day and there was honey in some of the uh, dishes, there were all kinds of bees around. Uh, so uh, despite these uh, challenges, apparently it was a good visit and certainly notable uh, that Grace Kelly, Princess of Monaco, came to visit Morven. Uh, her family uh, actually had a place in Ocean City. So that was, uh, and her dad owned the racetrack in Atlantic City. So that was how all these, these people knew each other. And if you'll recall, uh, it was Grace Kelly uh, in a very short period of time, from 1950 to 1955, made 11 movies, won the Academy Award for uh, Best Actress, and then in 1956, uh, she decided to be a princess, and that's when she married Princess Prince Rainier Grimaldi of uh, Monaco, gave up uh, all of the uh, the trappings of stardom, and uh, started to raise a family, and got involved with a lot of philanthropy, as as is pretty well known. So Grace Kelly, Prince Rainier, daughter Caroline, and son Albert were all visiting here on August 25th, 1975, where we are right now. And today is April 19th, which is would have been their 65th wedding anniversary. Right, thank you. Kim. There was a civil ceremony on the 18th, but the, the ceremony on the 19th with the beautiful dress that uh, uh, Christina Hoglan, uh, I think uh, had a, a recent presentation on uh, from the Philadelphia Art Museum. Uh, uh, and uh, so about 3000 people attended the civil ceremony and they were all uh, uh, you know, basically citizens of Monaco, but it was the next day April 19th, that was the big ceremony where people like Ava Gardner uh, and Cary Grant showed up, so uh, who, who had been co-stars with her in some movies. So uh, that is, uh, that's one of the reasons we're doing it on today because of that anniversary. Right, exactly. We wanna really commemorate uh, Grace's visit and one of the really cool celebrities of her era. And, and that's the interesting thing too about celebrity in general is that you know we mentioned a lot of names that at their in their time were just you know rock star <laughs> to, to quote unquote um, of their time and then now when we mention them sometimes we have to 
and quantify who are they, you know, um, which I, I think Stokowski would be floored to think that nobody, you know, not everyone knows who he was, but I, if I show a hands, how many knew who he was before we started today? So um, uh, we've got some questions. Uh, uh, Sarah asked if uh, Sarah Carpenter asked if Joseph Bonaparte was ever at Morven and uh, I that's a, a that. wonderful question and I just don't know. Well, I answered that in the chat actually. Uh, we do know that the Commodore visited Bonaparte's Point Breeze, which is in Bordentown, New Jersey. Right. But we don't have confirmed information that he, that Bonaparte visited Morvin. But, you know, historical research is ongoing. And now with the fact that they are going to be restoring and doing a lot with Point Breeze, um, we are hoping to be more involved with um, that research. So, yeah. Um, and the other question came in here was um, on the photo uh, upper left is O'Keefe and Stieglitz. Yes, that was. And I want to see if I can go back at all. Oh, I can. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I was <laughs> overlapping people. Yeah, that, yeah. So that um, George O'Keefe on the left and Stieglitz on the right. And then Leopold Stokowski on his uh, album cover, which there's another thing. How many people have albums right now? <laughs> Vinyl album. It, it's kind of rare too, uh, and it's nice to to bring these things back, right? Um, uh, okay. So here's a question: Did Albert end up going to Princeton? No, he did not. He did not go to um, Princeton, and I did know where he went. I, I think he ended up at Amherst. I was just gonna say it was Amherst. Up in Massachusetts. Yeah, um, and. Okay, did Governor Byrne go to, uh, I don't see the rest of the question there. Oh, I probably, I bet you the question is gonna be, did Governor Byrne go to Grace's wedding? Yes, and that's the question. I don't know, do you know, Kim? If no, I, I, I don't know. I think we would know that, uh, but I, I we can certainly look that well, up. Well, um, yeah, cause I just finished reading uh, the biography of Byrne and uh, I am sure he, he would have, mentioned something about that. Uh, and, and But remember in 1956, he was a relatively junior guy uh, in uh, uh, working for, for Governor uh, Minor as uh, kind of a, a key staff person. Uh, so it, 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 it's not only not documented to my knowledge, I, I just don't think it, it's very likely to, that it would have happened. Yeah, I don't think so either. And in fact, in an interview that Governor Byrne did um, that we have the transcript from, he talks about the fact that um, Governor Minor had a romance with Grace yeah. and talks a yeah. lot about that. I think if he was going to mention that he went to her wedding, he might have said something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, um, but some other people that we, we haven't mentioned um, during the Byrne era, Ethel Kennedy. Um, and we talked uh, right. about yeah. She, she came uh, to the charity tennis tournament. Uh, Byrne inaugurated the annual Governor's Cup. So, um, you know, heading back to the tennis the, court. Oops. Yeah, it, it'd be nice to learn more about the, the, the annual Governor's Cup. I wonder uh, if there are some other celebrities that, that we could identify if we dug into that a little deeper. Yeah, like I said, um, you know, research is ongoing. Uh, we also know uh, future Senator Bill Bradley visited uh, President Jimmy Carter, came before and after his presidency, not during. Um, uh, and remember Jean uh, mentioned in an interview uh, in 81, uh, towards the end of uh, the, their time in Morven that Prince Philip had visited. But we, I haven't seen any additional details beyond Jean, uh, Pre uh, uh, Brandon Burns' wife mentioning that. Right, right. Um, so if anyone knows of any celebrities that came to Morven, we're always open <laughs> to learning about new information. Um, the, uh, what, one person who, I don't know if he qualifies as a, as a celebrity, but he's certainly a notable person uh, for, for, for New Jersey is John McPhee, the author of The Pine Barrens, uh, which was published in 68 and, and as a book about the pine lands. And, and according to uh, Brendan Burns' biography, this this was the book that really got him interested in the Pinelands and doing the, uh, eventually getting the, the uh, Pinelands Preservation Act passed in 1979. And McPhee uh, apparently played tennis at Morven uh, starting in 1974. A lot of tennis happened at Morven. Um, and, and the pool, um, okay, so here is a question. Um, other than the pool house, were there any other significant changes to the Morven property inside or out? Wow, that's a big question. 
Um, uh, in which um, we, we covered a pretty big time frame here. So, so there are other significant changes. Well, the most recent significant change is right behind uh, Kim's right shoulder there is the Stockton Education Center. So that's on the Morvin property. We haven't spoken about and, that. Uh, and uh, one change that, that occurred uh, that was kind of striking for the house itself was the uh, what we call the garden room now. Because right. uh, I think it was probably uh, enclosed, it became an enclosed porch when Robert Wood Johnson was living there. And, right, and they call it a solarium at that point. Yeah, and then and Walter Edge, I think, made some additional changes. So it, more like the way it is now. Right, to, the, to a garden room. And um, as Jill Barry, who's on our chat there, our executive director mentions, Robert Wood Johnson modernized a great deal. Um, and, and he did as a renter, which to me always amazes me. He was a renter at Morven for 14 years. Uh, he rented from you know Helen Hamilton, Shield Stockton, and did so many things. Sometimes, you know, because he thought they were a good idea, but it was how, how great and ahead of his time uh, was it that he put the pool house, the pool, and the tennis court, because during his, that era, he wasn't able to travel with. Um, yeah, he was. He was unknowingly thinking ahead. Right. He was. He the original staycation home. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, of course, they also had that uh, uh, the ghost ranch that they would visit uh, where in, in New Mexico, where Georgia O'Keeffe was probably most of the time. And then I think they also had a place uh, up in uh, upstate New York. Right. Uh, Here at Morvin, they really did. Um, you know turn it into something that then when the governors were here, it was so well used. I mean, they, there is record of Governor Byrne holding meetings or poolside uh, at Morvan. He liked yeah. in time poolside. So- Well, he, had, uh, he was uh, actually a, a pretty good athlete. I mean, he started playing tennis late, but um, as a young man, um, he was he was a particularly, he, he, he was tall, but pretty thin, but he was still a good football and, and particularly baseball player. And in his short time when he was actually on campus at Princeton University, he actually ran track. Uh, so just to answer one uh, final response to the question about the changes to the Morvan property, uh, the governor's added a kitchen where the back porch is now. So if you, uh, you can't see it in this um, picture, but I'm gonna take us back a little bit when you can see uh, you can, if you look between the arch over to the right, beyond the um, other building there, which is the um, ice house, that's our back porch area, and that would be where the the kitchen was. Um, and the, oh, another question here just popped in. Uh, can you comment on Buzz Aldrin's visit to Morvin? Interesting that you bring that up. Um, we know that Buzz Aldrin visited Morvin from the information that we have in a guest book. Um, but there's a little question on exactly what his visit entailed, and we're still looking into that, but we do know he visited, um, yeah. Yeah, we, we've got some, uh, some background to get on that one. So any other questions? This was a lot of fun going back in time with some of these hot celebrities of their day. And I guess that's all the questions we have. So thank you so much for joining us today for the lunchtime bites with Morvin Moments. And we hope we'll see you next month. Things lined up for May. So thank you again. Thanks. Bye. The first.